BBC Radio Scotland. Downing Street has rubbished the suggestion that the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce was forced out after publicly backing Brexit. John Longworth was suspended from the role after speaking out during the organisation's annual conference, saying the UK's long-term prospects might be brighter outside the EU. He tendered his resignation last night. The former Lib Dem leader Lord Campbell of Pitt and Weem has just been appointed to lead the European movement in Scotland's campaign to stay in the EU. Speaking earlier on the programme, he dismissed the allegation that the agents of Project Fear were behind Mr Longworth's downfall. Well, remember, the problem here is that he was in a position as the head of, as the executive head of that organisation, which is made up of members, and all of its members don't necessarily uh, share his views, and they'd taken a neutral stance. In fact, when I heard him say it, I thought to myself, there could be trouble here, and obviously there has been, because he was suspended, not by David Cameron or anyone else. He was suspended by the executive of the organisation, of which he was the head, and now he's thought it right to resign. And I think one has to be pretty careful if uh, it's being suggested as some kind of conspiracy. I mean, let's reject all these conspiracy theories. Uh, I mean, people, if they want to have them after the 23rd of June in the Conservative Party, fair, fair enough. But up until then, we have a duty to concentrate on the arguments which are absolutely central to the question, do we stay or do we go? Well, Jack Montgomery is the Scottish spokesperson for the Leave.EU campaign group and joins us now. Good morning to you. Good morning. And was Mr Longworth the architect of his own downfall here? <laughs> I couldn't possibly say. I think it's interesting that a lot of people who were close to the government or former government ministers think that the BCC was leaned on, um, but there's no way of knowing whether or not that's true. But did he make what a I mistake think... actually publicly giving his position, which was at odds with ne the neutrality of the wider organisation? It's never a mistake to voice an honestly held and considered opinion um, in a personal capacity. There's been a lot of people on the other side of the fence who've been voicing their opinions. Think about all the, the 36 FTSE company chiefs who came out to say they backed the European Union. None of them consulted their shareholders on that. Uh, the CBI uh, is openly in favour of the continued membership of the European Union, but they've not um, conducted a full poll of all their members. It's, uh, it seems to me it's sort of classic of uh, the way this debate's being conducted. People are being told if you're in favour of Brexit, keep quiet or there'll be consequences. So, in your view then, the British Chamber of Commerce, Chambers of Commerce should have done what? Just, just said, these are his personal views, the organisation itself is neutral, but you know, there'll be those amongst uh, the, the BCC who, who share differing views? Well, precisely, yeah. As regards the other voices in all of this. We had the French President Francois Hollande saying he wants the UK to stay in the EU. He warned of consequences for immigration and the economy if we left. I mean, are, the, are these the big issues, do you think, that people will ultimately decide whether to, to vote one way or the other on? Immigration and the economy will be the big issues, I think. Yeah, those are the two main, those are the two most important things to voters uh, all over the United Kingdom. Um, President Hollande saying there would be consequences was very vague. He was obviously doing Mr Cameron a favour because he made that absurd claim that uh, thousands of people would be able to come from the Cali jungle to the United Kingdom overnight. I'm happy to see that that has since been sort of totally slapped down by uh, the Interior Minister, who's in charge of immigration policy, who said it would be irresponsible, uh, create a humanitarian crisis, and because the British control their own border, would only see a greater influx of people into France. But do you accept that there will be consequences? There may well be consequences, as you see it, of staying as well, but that there will be consequences uh, when it comes to the economy and when it comes to migration of a Brexit? Well, yeah, there'll be, there'll be positive consequences, I would have thought, from, from, from a migration point of view. We'll be able to finally control uh, migration into this country and by people who hold EU passports. In terms of the economy, I imagine there might be there might be a wobble in the money markets or something in the short term, but we'll be much more capable of opening up our country to trade globally. We'll be able to shed ourselves of some damaging regulations, such as the Clinical Trials Directive, for example, and they'll be they'll end up being a positive uh, benefit, just as uh, John Longworth uh, said. But people point to Switzerland, for instance, and say there's a country that. Uh, it 
isn't a member of the EU, but still, because of its trading relationship and the deal it's negotiated with the EU, still has to pay money to the EU, doesn't have any influence, and still has to deal with the free, the, the free movement of people. Would Britain not be in the same position, potentially? I don't see why it should be. I mean, that's the, that's the position that the Swiss have chosen for themselves. The Swiss, interestingly, just um, a few days ago, uh, formally withdrew their long-resting application to join the European Union. Ten years after, they conducted a cost-benefit analysis, which uh, figured out that joining would cost them nine times more than their current arrangements. Uh, so it's obviously working for them. They're a rich, prosperous country. But there's other countries around the world, like, say, Mexico or South Korea, that have a relationship with the European Union based solely on um, free trade and goods and services. Some cooperate, voluntary cooperation in areas uh, where that's of benefit to both sides, and that's the position we would end up being in. Well, We're you see, the European well, you Union's single biggest export market. We would have enormous leverage over them in any kind of bilateral negotiation. You say that's the position we would end up in, but actually that's not necessarily the case, is it? it, it it's feasible here, as you, as you point out, in terms of the, the deal that the British government would negotiate with the EU, that we could be in the same position as Switzerland, i.e. paying, having the free movement of people, but lacking the influence that we have at the moment. It's, well, it's a question really for the government. I mean, Cam Mr Cameron says that we need to say what um, Brexit will look like, but he says he's going to stay on and negotiate it. So he needs to tell us what's his plan, what's the strategy he's going to pursue. It's irresponsible for him to say, you need to say what Leave's going to look like, when he's going to be the one who's going to be in charge of deciding what Leave's look like, and who is not making any contingency plans, probably because it would turn out they would be some quite good plans that we could come up with, and he doesn't want to have to disclose them under freedom of information. As I say, the Swiss, when they conducted their cost-benefit analysis, figured out that even their not-ideal relationship works out nine times cheaper than being in the EU. Jack Montgomery, Scottish spokesperson for Leave.EU. Thank you very much for that. 18 minutes tonight.